morning, good morning or afternoon or evening, depending where you are joining us from. And welcome to the second lecture of the 2020-2021 Mandelbaum Family Lecture Series, Where Do We Go From Here? A Vision for the Jewish World in the COVID-19 Era with Chief Rabbi Dr. Warren Goldstein at the San Diego Center for Jewish Culture at the Lawrence Family JCC, Jacobs Family Campus. I am Lauren Lidke, the Program Coordinator for JLearn, which is our adult Jewish education department here at the Lawrence Family JCC. We are so excited to have you all here with us today, supporting the significant series and of course supporting our community and supporting Jewish education. This year is no doubt very different, uh, but such a beautiful opportunity to welcome our community members and speakers from near and far in a way that hasn't been possible in years past. And that is evident in no better way than with our speaker today who is joining us all the way from South Africa, which is uh, such an incredible treat. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the incredible underwriters who make this series possible, Mercy and Ron Mandelbaum. And additionally, I would like to thank the underwriters of our jailer department and the San Diego Center for Jewish Culture. Uh, before we get started, I just wanna mention a couple of logistical pieces for today's presentation. Um, as always, please know that your camera, if it's on, that is awesome, but we can all see you. So please just be aware of that as we move through the program. Also, we will have time for a Q&A at the end. Um, so please, if you do have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or save them for the Q&A portion at the end of the program. Uh, so now, without further ado, I'm very pleased to introduce Chief Rabbi Dr. Warren Goldstein. Rabbi Goldstein is the current Chief Rabbi of South Africa and a global Jewish leader, the youngest person to ever be elected to the position. Chief Rabbi Goldstein is a strong advocate for creative, proactive leadership and effective partnership to find unique solutions to the challenges of our time. He is the founder of the Shabbat Project, which unites Jews annually in over a thousand cities on an unprecedented scale. And you might be aware we just had our uh, Shabbat celebration just at the beginning of November. He's an executive member of South Africa's National Religious Leaders Council, through which he is involved with strengthening interfaith relations in the country between Jews, Christian, Muslims, Hindus, and other faiths, as well as engaging with the government on national policy matters. A qualified Jewish law judge, Rabbi Goldstein has published several books, including African Soul Talk, when politics is not enough, Defending the Human Spirit, Jewish Law's Vision for a Moral Society, Sefer Mishpat Sedek, a detailed analysis of Torah business law and ethics with particular focus on competition law, and The Legacy, Teachings for Life from the Great Lithuanian Rabbis. So without further ado, I would love to welcome Chief Rabbi Dr. Warren Goldstein. Thank you so much for being here today. Great. Thank you, Lauren, um, and uh, it's, uh, thank you so much for your warm introduction, your generous words, and uh, for the invitation to, to join all of you today. Uh, it's always such a, a pleasure to, uh, to talk to the San Diego Jewish community. I have so many good friends um, in, in San Diego, um, and, uh, and, and I know that there are many um, members of the community in San Diego who, who are originally from South Africa, and that's something which uh, brings us all great pride because South Africans, wherever they are, make a wonderful uh, contribution to the community and to the development of the community wherever they find themselves. And so that's something which always uh, brings me a lot of, of great joy. Also know that the uh, San Diego Jewish community have been amazing partners in the global Shabbat project. And um, I wanted to mention uh, Simone in particular for our outstanding work this year and in previous years, uh, dedication, professionalism. Um, also want to, uh, to thank Selwyn um, you know, for, for, for his amazing work in this. So th th there's so many wonderful people in, in San Diego and uh, I feel very much um, a, a, a strong uh, bond and connection. Spent a few days in San Diego um, just a few years ago and really enjoyed the trip. It's a beautiful, beautiful city. And thank you so much for, for hosting me today. It's so wonderful with, uh, with technology to be able to connect 
and and uh, and and at the same time not to have to do um, the, uh, the 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 long flight, which you know from South Africa to New York is 18 hours, and then on to uh, to the West Coast is, uh, is 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 a whole bunch more. So it's it's so special and wonderful. I was actually talking to my family tonight at dinner because already here it is uh, almost you know just after 20 to 9 p.m. in the uh, in the evening. And I was just saying to them, I'm soon, I'm just going off to San Diego tonight just for a quick chat. And so that's the, 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 the beauty of all of this. Um, what I wanted to talk to you about, and I, you know, I, I wanted to share a few words and then uh, really open up for, for some questions and comments and uh, you know, I believe in, in, in dialogue. But let me, let, let, let me just address a few words here because um, the, the, you know, the, the, the subject is really looking at the, the Jewish world today in this COVID-19 era and, and, and hopefully soon a post-COVID-19 era. Because, but even when it will be post, when the vaccine is out and life starts to return to some semblance of normal, um, the, the after effects of what uh, this, the world has gone through, the trauma of the last number of months, uh, indeed, you know, um, really for, for the vast majority of 2020, is a trauma that is going to stay with the world uh, on an ongoing basis. And so as we, 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 we may get past the immediate danger of the virus, but the, the after effects, both from a health point of view, a financial point of view, political point of view, is going to be long lasting. And uh, we need to sort of think about how we are going to be part of rebuilding the world and rebuilding the Jewish world and to give that real creative thought and, uh, and, and to realize that we need to approach it all with, with a real spirit of innovation. And that's the, the first point that I wanted to, to, um, to make. And that is when, when approaching this, we need to really be creative and, and it's in the same as in our lives. And what I would like to base my remarks on tonight is an amazing statement in the Talmud, which says that we have a calling to be, in the Hebrew it says, shutaf lahakadosh baruch hu b'mayse to be a partner with God in creation. And, um, and that, that has two elements to it. One is creation and the other is partnership. And both are vitally important. Creation is about a spirit of innovation. It's about looking at the world and looking at our lives and not accepting the status quo, not accepting things the way they are, but rather challenging and working out how they could be better and not accepting problems for what they are, but trying to, to find a way around it and to realize that we live in a world which is fluid. The fluidity of the world creates uncertainty, but it also creates opportunity and possibility. The world is literally alive with possibility. That uncertainty that comes with the, the, the fluid situation is also something which is emotionally taxing on, on all of us, which is what we've been through in these months. But it is the, the, the very uncertainty of the world that also means that it is open to change and there is no such thing as the status quo. And that means we need to approach it with a sense, a real sense of creativity. And something that I've learned, I've uh, been, um, my appointment as chief rabbi was, uh, was actually announced uh, the 3rd of December, um, uh, the 3rd of December, uh, 2003. And, and so that's 17 years, almost uh, tomorrow will be 17 years since uh, my appointment as chief rabbi was announced. Um, there was still a, a year of, of transition. I started office in the first, 1 January 2005. And what I've learned in these 17 years is that the most important uh, approach when dealing with problems in the world and dealing with uh, potential solutions is not to get stuck in the way that we assume things to be, but rather to really look and, and, and approach the problem with no, with no preconceptions. And uh, one example of that has been an initiative that I, I started together with a number of, um, of, of brilliant communal leaders who, who joined me in it to establish CAP Community Active Protection, um, which is an anti-crime organization. As everyone knows, uh, that has been one of the problems that South Africa has struggled with in recent decades, the problem of violent crime. And so we established in, in Johannesburg, a, a proactive crime fighting organization called Community Active Protection, which has actually, thank God, brought down contact crime in its areas of operation um, uh, between 80 and 90%. And it's protecting uh, around about 250,000 residents of Johannesburg uh, right across all 
uh, racial and religious groups and faith organizations and, um, and, and cultural uh, divisions within the society and uh, providing this incredible protective uh, cover and, uh, and, and a way of defending against crime. And when we started on that journey, people said it was impossible to solve. And, and really when one confronts a problem and a challenge like violent crime or any problem in life, when one needs to approach and say, there is no status quo. This is anything is possible. The world is alive with possibility. And so brilliant people came together and identified that the, you know, the heart of the problem was the importance of securing the public space, not just the private space and getting community to work together and galvanize community and uh, employ the best professionals and analytics and legal department and all of that. And, uh, and then of course, you know, everything that happens in this world needs the blessings of, of God. And, uh, and, and, and so that's, that's been an important lesson. When we talk about being a partner with God in creation, the, the starting off principle is that the world is still being created. It's not cast in stone. The, 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 the reality that we face is not a reality which is um, cast in stone. It is a reality which is fluid and open to change, and we need to believe in that. And, and that also means believing in our own lives. You know, I, I think an important part of creativity and not accepting status quo is not only about the macro issues of how to confront the problems of society, but even our own problems in, within our lives. Uh, are we really capable of change? Many people believe that we're not. People think that you are who you are and you, you have your certain character traits and you have your, your personality and you have your abilities and you have certain things which are set and your ability to move outside of those lines and your ability to really change is severely limited. But to believe that, to, that we're a partner with God in creation means not only creating the outer world, but it also means creating the inner world. That means believing we are able to overcome uh, all of the things that hold us back, our limitations. We are able to we are able to overcome to become better people, people of forgiveness, people of kindness and compassion, people of humility, uh, people of uh, of generosity. We can improve ourselves in all of these areas, as well as becoming better Jews. You know, sometimes we impose self imposed limitations a person can say you know since starting the shabbat project for example um uh, in, in in october of 2013 in south africa and then it's spreading to the whole world with us where, where this year in 2020 we had shabbat project activities in more than 1600 cities in 105 countries around the world and there was really a sense in, in you know when we got started was this possible is is are, are, are people really capable of connection to shabbat and many people even questioned about themselves are they capable of even keeping a shabbat in the traditional sense of keeping it switching off cell phones not driving in cars uh, not not using electronics or screens and really having a completely connected Shabbat through disconnecting from everything else and really connecting with ourselves and the people around us. Many people felt, well, no, that's, that's, that's for religious Jews. That's not for me. And, and that's a self-imposed limitation. That's a self-imposed um, definition. And, and part of the, the journey of the Shabbat project is driven by optimism, optimism and faith, optimism and faith in our ability to change and to achieve greatness where we do not accept limitations and we do not lock ourselves into what is perceived to be the, the, the maximum that we can achieve, but realize that we're able to go way beyond that and, um, and, 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 and truly achieve great things. And so that, that kind of optimism and faith is belief in the fact that we can change. We are able to change. We are able to keep a Shabbat. We are able to become a kinder, more generous person. We are able to forgive people who, who we may have who may have hurt us so badly. We are able uh, to, to reach greater heights and to become better people, to become more learned, more wise, uh, and, and more enlightened in every dimension of who we are, and to constantly strive for change. And, and, and that is part of this vision of being a partner with God in creation, is a belief that we are capable of change and that the world can be changed and that things can improve and that we can improve ourselves starting off point of being a partner with God in creation is to truly believe that we are capable of um, of, 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 of true change and, uh, and 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 to be able to achieve that we must 
we must believe in it. And so being partners with God in creation is a belief in the status quo. It is a belief in rejecting the status quo and acceptance of a fluid situation, which means that it's alive with possibilities. Being a partner with God in creation also means believing in ourselves. And this is so important, believing in our own greatness. It's something that I learned from um, Nelson Mandela, you know, one of the great leaders of the world. When, uh, when I first met him, um, as just before I assumed office as, uh, as chief rabbi, I'd met him casually in, at events and that before, but a, a, a proper meeting where, where, where we spent time alone in his study, discussing things as I prepared to, to take over the, the, the leadership of the community and to assume the office of chief rabbi. And uh, in that meeting, I came with a little bit of uh, Jewish chutzpah and came with children's books of, um, of, the, of the story of, uh, of his life. You know, he wrote his autobiography is called Long Walk to Freedom. And then there was a children's version that was published of the Long Walk to Freedom. And I took that uh, on behalf of my two sons and, um, and said to him, you know, would he sign, would he autograph them? And so he asked me my son's name. Um, so I told him Mordi, and he wrote and he inscribed the book. And he said to Mordi, a future great leader of the world. That's what he inscribed the book. And, um, I, when, you know, when I came home from the meeting, I showed it to my wife. And of course, she agreed completely with Nelson Mandela that our son was going to be a future great leader of the world, uh, as any good Jewish mother uh, would, would, would certainly believe. But uh, the, 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 the important thing is this. Of course, Nelson Mandela did not know my son, Mordi, but he, he, he wrote that in the book at the time because this was his philosophy of the, philosophy of the world. He authentically saw greatness around him all the time. He saw people's greatness. He saw their potential. He saw the, 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 the capacity for the human spirit to achieve great things. And he believed in people. I saw that when I attended events that he was at, the way he spoke to every single person there, not only the, uh, the powerful politicians and media people, but also the people who were serving and helping and um, and, and, and worrying about the practical logistics of what was going on. He spoke with kindness and compassion to all because he saw their greatness within. And, um, and this is a very profound teaching in Judaism, the, 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 the fact that, as, as it says in, in, in Pirkei Avot, Chaviva Adam Shinib Rabbi beloved is the human being created in God's image. And that means believing in the same way that we have faith in God, we have faith in people because every human being is created in God's image. And that means there is innate divine greatness within every person. And, and that is the principal evil of racism. What is the principal evil of racism? It's the denial of human potential. Because what it is saying is that because of the color of a person's skin or because of where they come from, they are incapable of true greatness and that therefore their, their, their dignity does not have to be respected and uh, they, they do not have to be given the space to, to grow and develop as people. That in itself is the, the, the primary evil of racism. Of course, there's the infringement of dignity, infringement of equality, all of these values, but at the heart of it is the denial of human potential. And um, we see this in the verse in the Torah when it says, be kind to the stranger, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. And the conventional understanding of that is we know what suffering and persecution is all about, and therefore we must be uh, at the forefront of defending the rights of others because we as Jews know what it is to suffer um, at the other end of racism. But the one of our commentators on that, Rav Naftali Tzvi Berlin, the Natsiva Velozhin, he says what that means is be kind to the stranger because you were strangers in the land of Egypt, and, and the Torah is telling us this, God is telling us this with this verse, we know the potential of the stranger because in Egypt, it was about us whom, of whom they said nothing would become of us. It was in Egypt amidst the slavery that they said we, we were the threat to society. And it was about us whom they said in Egypt that uh, we, we, had, um, we, we were destined to be slaves and could never rise above that station. We were written off and treated as a threat. And yet when God liberated us from Egypt and he gave us the Torah at Mount Sinai, we have flourished as a nation and made an enormous contribution to the development of human civilization. Look what became of us. And therefore, a person who is cast aside as the other, as the stranger, who is rejected because they appear to be different from another, that be aware and protect against that 
because um, no, we know the potential of the stranger. We know the potential of the one who's cast aside because we were in that position. And so what, what non-racialism means is a reject is is a protection of human potential. Racism, apartheid, is the is 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 condemning a, another human being and saying they have no greatness within them because of who they are. And and so being a partner with God and creation means not only believing in the the possibilities of the world to be fluid, to be changed, that our own lives are fluid and changed, but it also means to believe in ourselves and to have faith in ourselves that we have strength and we have capability and we have potential within us, which is truly awe-inspiring. And, uh, and, and that's part of the vision of what it means to be a partner with God in creation. What it also reminds us, and this is a third principle. So the, the principles are uh, creativity and innovation. It is, uh, it is about faith in the greatness of the human spirit. The third principle, is partnership because if we are partners with god in creation it also means that we are partners with each other and and that there that all of good which needs to be done in the world must be done in partnership god does not need partners he could have done it all himself if there is any being that could achieve everything himself without needing us it was god and yet he made space for us and invited us to be his partners that is the greatest compliment of ever uh, the, the greatest compliment imaginable but he was teaching us by example. God teaches us by example. He invites us to be his partners. Therefore, we must invite partners. We, we, it is, uh, as, as it says right at the beginning of the creation um, of the, the very first human being, Lord Tov, hey, yot Adam Levador, it's not good for a person to be alone. We need each other. And, and great things are done in this world when we work together and when we, we collaborate, it is through the collaboration of human beings coming together that great things are achieved because it is the combination of our talents and the combination of our strengths that make us all much stronger because each one of us has strengths and weaknesses. Each one of us has areas of talent and areas of challenge. And it is the combination of the two that complements one another that we are able then to create the sum total of strength through engagement and strength through, through coming together. And I've seen that so powerfully in the Shabbat project. The power of the Shabbat project is that it is a people's movement. It is not something which is top down as an organization hierarchical with a headquarters somehow based in Johannesburg, South Africa, issuing orders across the globe to 1600 cities which would be logistically impossible. But it is about empowering people everywhere in the world that in the same way, and you've seen this in San Diego, you've seen how Shabbat San Diego has a, has a sense of, of pride and ownership of what the Shabbat project means in San Diego. And that is something which is, which is so powerful. And that is true in all of the 1600 cities across the world. People feel like it belongs to them and it does because it's a partnership. What makes the Shabbat project successful is that as a partnership, it is, it, is not, it is not a hierarchical organization that is handing down orders to the branches from, uh, from on high. It is rather a collaboration of partners all around the world, thousands of volunteer partners, more than 6,000 volunteer partners spread across the world, an army of people speaking all kinds of languages from obviously English to Spanish and French and Russian and Hebrew and German and Portuguese and uh, Jews from all backgrounds and all cultures and all languages and all countries and all continents coming together because there's a shared sense of partnership. And, and that, that is indeed what, uh, what Shabbat is about, is about a partnership. In fact, the Talmud says that when we, uh, when we say Kiddush on Friday night, uh, we become partners with God in creation because we're on Shabbat we remember and declare to the world that God created the universe. He created us and he created us with purpose and, uh, and that he invited us to become his partners. And we, we remember that on Shabbat and we remember about partnership. So being a partner with God in creation means believing in a world which is alive with possibility. It means creativity. It means believing in the greatness of the human spirit. It means believing in partnership. And it means, um, it, it means believing in a, 
in, in, in a compelling divine vision that God created us with purpose, if he invited us to be his partners in creation, it is because he wants us, he created us with a purpose. He did not create us merely to, um, to, to survive. He created us with a purpose to do good things, to do mitzvahs, to make a difference to the world, to follow his commandments, to keep Shabbat, to give charity, to be a good Jew, to, to pray, to help one another, to, uh, to, 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 um, to do all of the things that make up what it means to be a Jew through our 613 commandments. And he gave us that vision because he believes in the, the purpose of the world. The fact that we say that we are partnered with God in creation means he created our world. And that is what Shabbat declares to the world. That means we live a life of purpose. Our lives are not random. Our lives are not accidents. Our lives are not just a matter of coincidence. Our lives are filled with a sense of purpose and a sense of mission of who we are. And that is all contained within this concept, this radical concept that God invites us to be his partners. It is a radical concept, but it is an optimistic concept. It is a concept which, which imposes on us a sense of responsibility because anything is possible. And that if God has faith in us, surely we must have faith in ourselves. And if God believes we are worthy to be his partners, then we must also believe that we are worthy to be his partners. And if God thinks that we can change the world and change ourselves for the better, then we can also believe that we can change ourselves and change our world for the better. And if, if, if God believes that um, we have within us the capacity to work with others, to find space in our hearts for other people, and to include others in our lives and to work with a spirit of humble collaboration and an open partnership, then that is, uh, that is indeed our vision. And so that's what I wanted to share with you to say that if we, if we want to rebuild our world after the devastation and the trauma of COVID, we need one clarion call and that is to, to become partners with God in creation. We have to recreate our world, we have to rebuild it but we must do so as partners, partners with each other and partners with God. And we must do so with a, a spirit of, of optimism and faith in the future. Um, and so that's what I wanted to share with you today. I'm very happy to, um, to, to, to take a few questions um, and, uh, and, you know, and, and to engage in some dialogue um, because I feel that, you know, uh, it, it, it's, it's important instead of me just doing all of the talking, it would be, it would be wonderful to hear from you. Thank you so, so much, Rabbi. I think that it's such a timely and significant message right now um, and needed more than ever. So, so appreciate uh, that, that beautiful, your beautiful words and for sharing that with us today. And um, we can take some questions. Um, if anybody would like to include them in the chat, you can go down to the bar below and you'll see a little chat symbol and you can put them in there. Or you also have an option to unmute and uh, speak directly with the rabbi, whatever you're most comfortable with. Um, but just to kind of get the things started. So um, as you were speaking, I was thinking um, what, how would you say is a good way to apply these principles, like those three principles um, directly to our current situation? Because it's, it's about partnership and about this divine um, human spirit. And so what are some steps that we as a community, either on a small scale or a larger scale, can start to work through, as you say, the trauma of our current situation? Well, one practical thing, and uh, maybe people will find it predictable um, that I would say this, but I, I believe that um, Shabbat in particular has a powerful message for us, both from, from a community point of view as well as an individual point of view. Uh, because it addresses many of the traumas that we are, that we have gone through. Firstly, uh, during this time, we we although we've been through trauma, we've also seen the beauty of our homes and the beauty of of of, of our uh, lives in in a uh, more contained sense. Uh, Shabbat helps us hold on to that. That when there's a vaccine, we go out into the world. We're going to need 
We're going to need the haven of our homes, and, and Shabbat provides that. Also, Shabbat connects us with a faith in God because it declares that God created the world. It also, and that we need, we need that sense, you know, the, the, chal, the challah on our Friday night table, Shabbat lunch table, and at the third meal, the challah represents the manna that fell from heaven. Um, because the, the, which, which is a symbol that God is looking after us. And we, in a time like this, we need to draw on that faith and to realize that we are in God's hands. And that doesn't mean that things are always going to turn out the way that we wish them to, but it does mean that he loves us and he's looking after us and that he, he's holding us. And then I think is very important for people. But what, what I would also challenge people is to say this, that there is an opportunity for a total immersive experience in Shabbat. A, 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 the, the experience of putting aside cell phones and screens, putting aside our car keys, really diving right in and knowing we can do it um, and, and being totally enriched from that experience. Not only the experience of putting aside all of the distractions and the burdens of life, but, at the, but also to connect with the prayers, with the, with the meals, with the, with the grace after meals, the, the, the benching, the birkat amazon, uh, the words of Torah at the table, I think that can be uh, something really powerful. The other thing um, on a practical level that is, is to begin a journey of Torah learning, um, you know, which I'm, I, you know, I know that's something that you encourage. Um, and, you know, later on, um, uh, you know, in, in the next number of months, we'll be we're looking at the, the launch of, of a global uh, Pirkei Avot learning to, uh, to learn one of, you know, the classics of, uh, of the Talmud, which contains so much of Jewish values, Pirkei uh, Avot, which is, is so famous and beloved to the Jewish people. And it's a chance to reconnect with that. So I think, you know, those are, those are two areas. And the third I would think about is the importance of giving charity. Uh, and and, and that's, that, that is something so important, tzedakah, which comes from the Hebrew word tzedek, which is justice. And it is and righteousness and, uh, and 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 not as like the English word charity, which implies that it's a charitable act to uh, to to give it, but but not something which is which is required from the perspective of the halacha, from Judaism's perspective, charity is is the basics, and giving ten percent of disposal income is the minimum definition of, uh, of of what is considered to be generous. So these are these are three practical steps that we need to begin. We need to make it real for ourselves shabbat torah learning and and charity and uh, and and i would add in there as well very important you know to to speak kindly to people and about people because kindness brings kindness and gentleness brings gentleness and peace brings peace and our world needs more gentleness and less harshness it needs more peace and more love and less um and less conflict so so i think these are some practical steps Thank you so much. We have a couple really wonderful questions from one of our um, speaker, I'm sorry, one of our attendees. So I'll read this. In the website I run, I do my best to apply the principles you outlined. Even in the midst of counseling optimism and hope, we often do it in the midst of despair and feelings of helplessness. How might we best walk with people who might be unable to grasp that light you speak of or are resistant to it altogether. And then also I can hear you speaking of rest right now as I write this, how can people find optimism via this time of structured rest? So the first question is um, how might be what, sorry, how might we best walk with people who might be unable to grasp that light you speak of or are resistant to it altogether. And then I hear you speaking of rest right now. How can people find optimism via this time of structured rest? I think that, you know, in, in, in answer to the first question, the most important thing is empathy. Um, people need to feel understood and, and heard. And they need to be able to express their pessimism if that's, if that's what they're feeling. And, and one can't deny a person their feelings. What we need to say is that, and I think this is the important thing, one can hold in one's heart uh, contradictory feelings. There's space in, in, the human, in the human heart for pain and joy. There's space for optimism and pessimism. There's space for dis despondency and hope. And, 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 and what I would say to a person who's feeling despondent is don't try and, uh, 
you know, um, dismiss the feelings of despondency because the more you try to dismiss them, the, the harder, the, the more tenacious they will hold on to us. But rather to say, let's make space for optimism as well and to believe that th there are things which are possible and, and slowly but surely the more light that we can bring in, uh, the more that those other forces will, the, the forces of, 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 of negativity will diminish, but, but they will always be there because the human condition is fraught with vulnerability, it's fraught with challenge, and, and the optimism does is not about denying the, the, um, the presence of the pain and the presence of the challenge, it is about saying that in spite of that pain and in spite of the challenge, we can achieve great things, and, and also to say Never mind in spite of it, but perhaps because of it. And, and that within pain and despondency is an opportunity for growth. Because when a person is in pain and they're getting pushed into actions and responses, that can unleash tremendous creativity, which can force a person to, to move to a next level that can transform themselves. And, and, and so through the pain can actually come uh, tremendous opportunities for growth. And, and, and that I think is, 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 is fundamental and crucial to this. It's a point that um, uh, Rabbi Yosef Dov Soloveitchik makes. He says that uh, we, when, when, when engaging with situations of crises, we can either view ourselves as a passive object or as an active subject who is using the crisis as a platform to achieve greatness. And, uh, and, and I think that's, that is also kind of the space that one, one needs to move in. And um, I think that, that Shabbat, and I think that's what we're referring to in the second part of the question, um, you know, the, 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 the rest of, um, of Shabbat, if I'm not mistaken, if I'm not misunderstanding the question, but it, but it has within a tremendous powers of creativity, which is not just about, you know, one of the biggest misconceptions about Shabbat is to refer to it as a day of rest, because the whole world is a day of rest. And, and it's true that the, the concept of a seven day week with a, with the weekend is something that is universal. I believe that it actually came from the Torah originally. So that has been, you know, that that came from God's revelation at Mount Sinai and seeped into the world. But the, but the Jewish Shabbat is fundamentally and and um, crucially different from the notion of a Sunday or a weekend. It is it is a day which is not an absence of stress. It is a day which is full of the richness of living and of connection, of uh, connection to the three core relationships that make up who we are, our relationship with God, our relationship with other people, and our relationship with ourselves. It is a day of relationships. It's a day of um, upliftment. It's a day of wisdom, a day of humility, a day of kindness, a day of faith. It is profoundly uplifting, but it is only so when one is when one is ready to take the leap and immerse in in the in, in the completeness of that experience, that is when it really opens itself up uh, to 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 that transformative experience, and and not just being seen as a nice day off with the family, because for that you don't you don't need Shabbat. The world has many nice days off with their families. Uh, you don't need Shabbat for that. Shabbat has got something completely magical and otherworldly that enters into our lives in, in, in the most transformative way. Thank you. I think that's a, such a beautiful point. And I really, it resonated with me what you said about um, kind of this idea of in moments of negativity or being in a negative space of, for lack of a better word, embracing it to an extent in order to work through the pain. So in trying to just overshadow it with, um, mounds and mounds of optimism that that's not really going to do the work. You need to understand the pain and the negativity in order to work through it and embrace it in the same ways that you would the, the optimism and the, and the positivity as well. And um, from that attendee um, who asked those questions, they said, uh, your novel concept of rest can be absolutely revolutionary for us. Deep thanks. So thank you for that. Okay, great. Um, who, who is that? Are they comfortable to say their identity on the? Um, sure, I'll let them. I'll let them say if they they are, and let you know. Um, and then we have another question: Where can we go for the Perkei Avot learning? Okay, so um, it's it's not launched yet. It's going to be launched in the next uh, few months, and so we'll make sure to to make you aware. Discussed it, you know, with the, with with Simone. 
and uh, you know, so you know, together with with the, some of our key volunteers around the world, uh, and that's coming soon. But it's going to be a few months away, and uh, I'll let you know as um, you know as as soon as that happens. But I'm I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be really so exciting, and um, yeah. So 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 look forward. If people want to also stay in touch with me, um, you know, to find out as things develop. Um, also, you know, uh, share a weekly um, uh, Prashat Shabua uh, podcast and article each week. So if people are interested in, in staying in touch and continuing this journey of learning, um, I'd be so happy to, you know, to, to, to do that. Um, and you can find it, you know, my, my website is chiefrabbi.co.za and uh, you, can, you can go on there and, um, and, 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 and continue the connection. We can continue to learn together through the the, the, the shirim that I give, uh, you know, on audio and written all the time. So I've I've, I've really enjoyed this, uh, Lauren, and I, I just wanted to thank you and and everybody. It's been a it's been a joy to be with you all, and uh, look forward to to future opportunities. So thank you so so much. Thank you so much, Rabbi. We are so appreciative of your time. And if we didn't get to your question, I will be sure to send those to um, Rabbi Goldstein after this presentation. Um, just before we wrap up, I just want to say once again, thank you so much to Chief Rabbi Dr. Goldstein for this incredible lecture. And of course, thank you to all of you for joining us. We're so grateful to be able to do this in the midst of everything still. And as always, that does require the support of the community. So if you're able, please consider donating to our Mandelbaum lecture series. Uh, you can donate by check or online. And in the follow-up email, I will provide steps for how to do that. We, we so appreciate your support. And it ensures that we can family from South Africa. I'm just, because uh, I know Mandelbaum's in South Africa, so. There you go. That's incredible. Okay, okay good. <laughs> I'll do all, all, all the best things come out of South Africa, right? All That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And we're getting a lot of things. Thank you. And so if you can, um, please join us on January 13th for our next lecture with Moore Shailon, who's a visiting professor with the Murray Gallinson San Diego Israeli Initiative. Again, that's Wednesday, January 13th at 1030 a.m. Pacific time. And that'll be our next Mandelbaum family lecture. So once again, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this morning, afternoon, evening wherever you might be coming in from. And wanna say another huge, huge and grateful thank you to uh, Rabbi Goldstein. We, we so appreciate you being with us all the way from South Africa. That is uh, an absolute treat. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, all thank you. Bye. Have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone.